Welcome to the Shepherd's Pie, a slice of hope to raise faithful kids, where we focus on topics that impact young people today. I'm Antony Barone Kolenk. I'm a father of five who served in the Air Force for 21 years. I'm now a law professor and a columnist for Practical Homeschooling Magazine. I'm also the author of The Harwood Mysteries, an inspirational medieval fiction series for kids aged 10 and up. Here on The Shepherd's Pie, we want to inform, to inspire, and to help you to raise happy, healthy, faithful kids. Whether you're a homeschooler, a youth group leader, an aunt or uncle, anyone. In today's episode, we'll be looking at creative ways to translate difficult theological and historical concepts to young people. Topics such as the Ark of the Covenant, the Real Presence in the Eucharist, and the Rosary as a form of prayer. My guest is Janine Zayo, an author and homeschooling mom of two grown sons, whose middle school book and scavenger hunt game about the Ark of the Covenant helped to demonstrate the importance of the Eucharist. In the entertainment review segment of the show, I'll be discussing the teen fiction novel, A Single Bead by Stephanie Engelman, which illustrates the power of prayer through the rosary. You know, there are a lot of tough concepts in history and the faith, lots of mysteries. How do we talk to young people about the Trinity, for example? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three persons in one Godhead, or the Rosary, and contemplating the various mysteries in the life of Jesus and of Mary. Even some of the historical concepts in the Old and New Testaments can seem stale, difficult for our youth to understand, a million miles away. They don't have an experience of living in an agricultural economy or living with the traditions of the patriarchs and Middle Eastern hospitality, or sacrificing animals for the atonement of their sins, the way that the Israelites did for so many centuries as set up in the Old Testament. These are concepts that are difficult to comprehend today in our modern world, concepts such as the Ark of the Covenant. And making a connection with youth would be much easier and much more effective if we can figure out how to bring the concept down to their level. Those of us who write fiction for young people, we do try to accomplish that by bringing out some of these lessons in the context of a story, like Jesus used to do telling parables to get his points across. For instance, in my Harwood Mysteries series, I set it in medieval England, 12th century, at a Benedictine Abbey, partly because the reader can totally immerse themselves in medieval life, and that includes such dangerous elements as bandits, and such religious elements as monks praying seven times a day, and historical elements such as feudalism, landlords owning property that serfs are living on practically as slaves. Like my main character, Zan, who is a serf, who in order to be able to make choices in his own life, first has to pay head money to his master. When you put these concepts into a story with conflict and characters and immerse your reader in a setting, they can take away all sorts of messages without attempting to preach to them once. But imagine translating those concepts into full body, full participation games like a scavenger hunt or an escape room. I remember as a kid playing manhunt or hide and seek. We'd be trampsing all about in the backyard or in the woods with groups of my relatives who would come to visit at Thanksgiving or Easter, hiding behind trees or under bushes. We could do that for hours and we wouldn't even get tired. We just loved it. In the interview segment today, my guest Janine Zayo puts her homeschooling chops to work, telling us how we can help kids connect to topics such as ancient Israel or the city of Jerusalem or even the Ark of the Covenant by developing these kinds of awesome games. We are with Janine Zayo, an author and retired homeschooling mom of two grown sons. She lives in South Carolina with her husband Paul and her dog Tula, and she travels throughout the Southeast, hosting an event where children can solve clues and tackle obstacles in their own hunt for the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, we're going to be speaking with Janine today not only about her middle school book, The Treasure with a Face, but also about the creative ways that she's found that you can connect with youth through games such as The Ark of the Covenant. 
I'd like to welcome to the show Janine Zayo. Thank you, Tony. That was a great introduction. I'm so happy to be here. So your kids are grown up, but you homeschooled them. So tell me a little bit about how, how did you make that work for all those years? I have a son who's 21 and a son who's 18, so I have been an empty nester for about a week now, and I don't love it. Um, but I am glad that I homeschooled because I felt like I got to savor the days with them and, and really enjoy learning alongside them. What advice might you have for any of our listeners who are either new to homeschooling or considering homeschooling? I would say just pray about it and have confidence that if God is calling you to it, he will help you through it. There was some purpose to me homeschooling, and I wasn't sure what that was, but I trusted in that, and that's why I ended up doing it. And I'm grateful now because I can see that that brought me joy, and it brought our family closer together. Wonderful. So I was intrigued when I saw that you have developed this escape room type game, which you're calling the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, can you describe what that game is? It's for kids over seven years old. And what they do is they come outside. It could just be a park or something. And I have landmarks from ancient Jerusalem set up. And their job is to solve clues and tackle obstacles in order to find the Ark of the Covenant. And so it's like an escape room, but without the walls. And it's just a really fun event to immerse kids into the setting for my book and help them try to understand what it was like to live in ancient Jerusalem. What is the Ark of the Covenant that you're referring to there? In the Old Testament, we learned that there was the Ark of the Covenant, and it's basically a box covered in gold um, made of acacia wood, and it eventually got put into the Holy of Holies in the Temple of Jerusalem. And a priest would go into the Holy of Holies one day a year on the Day of Atonement and speak to God who dwelled above the Ark. Um, and then when the Babylonians came, Jeremiah had the foresight to get the Ark out of the temple and hide it in a cave, but it went missing and it's never been found since. So um, despite Indiana Jones, <laughs> we don't know where it is. Uh-huh. So you didn't recover it from the big warehouse that Indiana Jones put in? <laughs> Have you have you developed these kinds of games as you were kind of a homeschooling mom with your own kids to to get them engaged in different areas that you were trying to teach them in? Uh, yes, in fact, um, I had a Willy Wonka birthday party one time. I had a scavenger hunt birthday party one time, and I did try to teach the kids in creative ways because I think when you learn that way, it's much more fun than just hearing a lecture. Yeah, I think that's so true. And there are so many ways that we can engage our youth to give them you know, meaning uh, in their lives and to teach them the faith. Give us an example of what kind of a riddle or puzzle would you have the kids have to solve in order to find the ark? So in my book, the character goes into a glowworm cave and I just thought, I was enthralled by the whole idea of it. So I am actually building a glowworm cave that will be portable that kids can crawl through and it'll have lights and you know, glowing paint. And um, on the wall, there will be a message written in glow paint that says walls. And that will tell them they need to go to the walls of Jerusalem to find the next clue. And what are glowworms for anybody who might not know? <laughs> So actually, they are they don't exist in Israel. I took a little creative license with that, but they're in New Zealand, and they're the worms that live in the cave, and they light up, and they also hang sticky strands to catch prey, and those light up. So they're kind of a turquoise color. They're beautiful, and it, it's just something I learned about maybe five years ago, and I thought, that is cool. I want to be able to experience that. So these are glow worms who have somehow been time traveled across <laughs> the world to ancient Israel. All exactly. Right. Why not? How long do you think it will take a, a typical kid to find the Ark of the Covenant in this game? So it should take about an hour. And the idea is that there will be teams of four children and they'll compete to see who gets the most points. And then the winning team gets to go out and find the actual Ark. Because I want that to be some a moment where they're all watching and all eyes on them as they carry it back, back to the temple. So that's how it will work. So this is the kind of project that a whole homeschool group could do together or a youth group at, at the church if they wanted to, you know, kind of do something different and fun. That's exactly right. If there are folks in the other, uh, other parts of the country and they're thinking, wow, that sounds like a lot of fun. How difficult is it for them to develop something like this themselves for their youth groups or homeschool groups? Yeah, it's not difficult at all. I think it's just a matter of trying to be creative and finding things that are engaging. And a lot of towns have scavenger hunts now. It's kind of a big thing. I wonder if, since you're using this to go along with your book, if you could develop something like this on your website where families could kind of get a like how to do it yourself kit, you know, using some of your ideas uh, for those people who are not in your area. 
Yeah, I love that idea. I, as a homeschooler, would have loved to bring teaching the kids about the Ark of the Covenant, about ancient Israel, about history of the Jewish people. I mean, there's so much that you can do with that. But so, and since it takes an hour, I'm assuming you must have a lot of different types of clues and educational clues in there. Can you maybe go into one or two of those? Yeah, sure. So I have um, these big poster board cutouts made of the temple, the Colosseum, the Valley of Gehenna, which is also called uh, the Valley of Slaughter, which was the big garbage dump in Jerusalem. And then there are other things like that, like the amphitheater. And so kids go from place to place and just solve the clues. And are the clues meant to be educational in any way, like where you are imparting some of the history of from the Old Testament or some history of Israel? Absolutely. So we talk about what are the things that were found in the Ark of the Covenant, and they look at different things like a menorah, which actually wasn't in the Ark. The Ten Commandments were Aaron's staff, a jar of manna, so they have to guess which of those things were in the Ark. There's other things where like a mirror plays prominently in my story. So there's a carnival mirror and a regular mirror, and they have to take a clue that's written backwards, but when they put it in the mirror, they can read it. I love this. I think this is such a, a great way of reaching kids. And what is the age range that you think kids would really get into this? Seven years old and up. It's really tailored to a nine to 13 year old, but if a high schooler is interested, they're welcome. So if they were in the Southeast and somebody wanted to figure out, how do I get Janine to come to my area and do one of these things? Uh, tell us a little bit about that. All they have to do is go to my website, janinezio.com and register there. Send me a link and we'll figure out when we can make it happen. And how far along the Southeast are you actually able to travel with this? Because my son goes to school in Florida, I'm willing to go to Florida, Central Florida, so Jacksonville, hint, hint. And then, of course, I could also go all the way up to North Carolina, across to parts of Tennessee. This sounds like a wonderful idea, but I know that you said you developed it to go along with your book. And we haven't really talked about your book yet. So tell us, the name of your book is Treasure with a Face. I know it released in September of 2021. Uh, what is the book about? So it's about a 12 year old boy named Eli who lives in ancient Israel during the time of Jesus. And he dreams of becoming a treasure hunter instead of his uncle Shem's metalsmithing apprentice. And I like to say uncle Shem's the kind of man who would tell Jesus that he walked on water the wrong way. Then uncle Shem sends Eli on a journey to Jerusalem to deliver his newest invention, which is a fragile mirror. And it seems like an impossible mission because it's 120 miles away and Eli's clumsy. But Eli sees it as a chance to begin his life as a treasure hunter, and he wants to find the ultimate treasure, which is the Ark of the Covenant. Um, now, the problem is, people don't all know this, but the flames shoot out the bottom of the Ark and apparently burn snakes and scorpions along the way. People who touch it die. We know that from the Bible. And on top of that, the Ark's been missing for hundreds of years. But Eli has a plan. He, he knows that if he can just find Jesus, Jesus will know where to find the Ark. Eli lives in Galilee, and Jesus has been to different cities like Cana and Magdala. Uh, Magdala and his mom and he have tried to meet Jesus, but they keep missing him. But he feels like if he can get to Jerusalem, surely Jesus will be there. I see. And he wants Jesus to help him figure out where the Ark of the Covenant is. And not only because they want to return the Ark to the temple, but Eli also feels like he's a captive in his own home because Uncle Shem is so hard on him. And he, he knows Jesus has come to free captives. And if he can just explain his situation, maybe Jesus can help him get the Ark and then launch him to treasure hunting status. Sounds like an exciting book. What, what age range should read this? I would say ages 9 to 13, but if you have a child who's receiving First Holy Communion, then you could always give them the gift and read it as a family read aloud. Are there other characters? Uh, I know uh, Eli's clearly a little boy. Are there any little girls in this book? There is. There's actually a girl who's a leper, and she is wow. full of spunk. And <laughs> despite her condition, she is hilarious. I love her. What's her name? Tamar. She just plays a small role in two chapters, and she's waiting for Jesus to come back and heal her. Her and Eli discover the glowworm cave together. I, I love this concept. It, it's like a national treasure, but in Jesus's <laughs> day uh, and in and Indiana Jones. Uh, so what kind of feedback have you had from those who've read the book? Well, I've been really happy because they've been so generous. Um, one person said it's a page turner. It's a suspenseful. It has interesting characters. Middle schoolers will love this book. People have also said it has a lot of heart, which means a lot to me. 
What I really want people to get out of this is the theme that they can still meet Jesus even though they don't live in 33 AD in ancient Jerusalem. I really want them to come to understand Christ's real presence in the Eucharist. But I do it in a way that's not preachy. It's really wrapped in an adventure with humor and suspense and drama, action. Now, there's no time travel in this book, is there? No, no time travel. All right. So, and, and uh, I don't want to spoil the ending and find out if he ever finds Jesus and if they ever recover the ark, but... You'll have to read it, definitely. <laughs> so, we've talked about the book. We've talked about the creative ways that you're able to tie this into this escape room type Ark of the Covenant game. What we haven't really talked much about is why are you doing all this? Why did you pick this age range and, and why did you focus on this particular time and topic? So what happened was about five years ago, I really wanted my kids to understand Christ's real presence in the Eucharist and what an unparalleled gift that is. And as I was thinking about ways to impart that lesson, the homeschooling mom and me said, you can't just give them a lecture. You need to tell them a story, kind of like Jesus did with parables. And so I got the idea for the story and it just evolved over five years into this book. So were, were some of your boys still middle schoolers when you started this? Yes, exactly. <laughs> they outgrew the book for sure, but I still hope they'll read it. Yeah, no, I, I, I hear what you're saying because my uh, first book I developed with my son when he was 12. And uh, let's just say that he graduated college years ago at this point, but he's still helping me try to figure uh, out the best plots for my, <laughs> for my sequels to the book. But uh, isn't it interesting how as parents, we, you know, we, we think of our own kids as an inspiration for doing something. Uh, and then our kids outgrow that. And, uh, and here we are doing it now for other people's families. It's so true. Absolutely. Uh, so why did you pick that particular time period, though? Because I suppose you could have done this anytime. I felt like it was really important to have Eli meet Jesus. I can't explain what happens without spoiling the whole story, but mm -hmm. it was critical that he be in the time frame of 33 AD. That makes perfect sense. Now, it sounds like you know a lot about the Ark of the Covenant. You really just were rolling those things off the top of your head a few minutes ago. And you probably had to do a lot of research. I know writing historical fiction, you know, you have to research a lot. Uh, what did you do to try to get some of these details of history right? You know, I actually went to a place called the Holy Land Experience in Florida. It's in Orlando and it's very immersive. Have you been there? I've driven past it a lot. And I've wondered every time I've driven past it, I wonder what that's like. Is it worth going to? So is it, Janine? It is worth it. They have plays and they have a replica of the temple. It's just, it is very immersive. It's very true to life. You can tell they've done a lot of research. I loved it. So that was helpful in kind of immersing yourself and what the environment would be that your character would live in. Right. Until I can get to the Holy Land, that was the next best thing. <laughs> But the book does immerse you into that and helps you learn about the various traditions, um, like working on Sabbath, what to do, what to do when you encounter a leper, various things like that. Like, what did children do? Did they work? Did they go to school? Although I gather all that from other places, I don't necessarily have one particular book that helped me with the research. It was really more like 20 different books, mm. but I enjoyed it. I think ancient Jerusalem is a fascinating place. And, you know, you could go to Jerusalem today to be in ancient Jerusalem and see the temple. It just, to me, it's a magical place. Is there anything that really surprised you or that captivated you that you didn't expect when you started researching for this book? I think the biggest thing was learning about Passover how every Israelite went to Jerusalem for Passover and there could be up to 2 million people in the city at one time. And think of all the lambs that were being slaughtered at that time. The amount of animal sacrifice that, you know, was going on throughout ancient Israel and the Old Testament is when you really start looking at it, it's kind of mind boggling. And to think that our whole, our whole faith stems from that and and then jesus being the lamb of god who is slain for us i mean if we don't get kids to connect to the idea they will miss that entire piece yes absolutely and i do touch on that a little bit in the book that um jesus is the lamb and the mass is the new passover it's part of the new covenant um and actually eli does meet with uh, one of the apostles and the Blessed Mother, and they s explain some of these things and make the connections between what we would call the New Testament and the Old Testament and how Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies. 
Wow. Yeah. There's so much to know. And, and how do you get kids interested? I mean, I think the approach that you've taken here, I'm, I'm excited about. I really hope that folks who are working with you can see this and, and get inspired themselves to think outside the box. Like, hey, I want to, I want to teach kids about ancient Israel, but that sounds boring. How do I do it? Well, what if I have a really cool story or what if I do a really cool scavenger hunt or other game? Uh, there's so many ways to interact beyond just getting them in front of you and talking to them, like you said earlier. Thank you. I appreciate that. I guess being a homeschooling mom, you start to think that way because you know you can lose them in a second to any little distraction. So you have to keep kids engaged and, and doing things really does help to do that. Absolutely. All right. So Janine, if folks want to get a copy of your book, what are the uh, sources that you would recommend? Okay, so they can go to my website, JanineZio.com, or my publisher's website, PerpetualLightPublishing.com, or of course on Amazon. And I would ask them, please ask your local Catholic bookstore to sell it, because I really want to support these small Catholic uh, bookstores. You know, that's so important. And I actually say the exact same thing in every interview I do about, about my books is, yeah, we can send people to Amazon to go get the book, which is fine. I mean, we buy plenty of stuff on Amazon. But why not send them to their local bookstore? You know, why not frequent mom and pop who are kind of getting killed by Amazon and could use the business? And then, frankly, they can stock your book on the shelf, too, right? <laughs> exactly. Uh, all right. So as we wrap up, do you have any uh, advice or parting words for our, our listeners about, uh, you know, in your experience, the best way they can really reach uh, their kids or their students with uh, the faith? Um, so I have a couple of things. My ministry is really encouraging devotion to Christ's real presence in the Eucharist. And I think instead of just catechizing children, you can give them great experiences surrounding the Eucharist. Uh, for example, our homeschooling group had an adoration camp out where we would set up tents across the street from the church. And our church would have nocturnal adoration all night before First Friday. Our families would have s'mores, play games, and then they would go to their tents at bedtime. But throughout the night, each family would take turns going over to spend time with our Lord. And that was just a great way to introduce kids to adoration. You know, they were up late at night, they were with their friends, and they, they remember it because it was something fun. And people who had never been to adoration went for the first time. So I think anytime you can surround important messages through a fun experience, it really helps. Yeah, I mean, the kids are so experiential, and especially nowadays, they don't want to be talked to. They want to experience it. And so the more you can do that, uh, the better. And I've really enjoyed having you on the show today, Janine. I think you've given me and, and uh, all of us a lot to think about on, on ways we can uh, do better when we're we're reaching out to our kids. Um, I've been talking with Janine Zayo, uh, author and a uh, homeschooling mom, about her new book, The Treasure with a Face, uh, for middle schoolers, and about Ark of the Covenant, her game for youth to discover the Ark. Uh, Janine, thank you for being on the show today. Thank you, Tony. I really enjoyed talking to you. In our entertainment review segment today, I review the teen novel A Single Bead by Stephanie Engelman, published by Pauline Books and Media. This book is appropriate for both middle and high schoolers. It addresses the power of prayer, especially the rosary, and it portrays the Blessed Virgin Mary as being actively involved intervening in the lives of everyday people in need, even working various miracles through her intercession with Jesus. The story follows a teenage girl named Kate who has lost her grandmother a year earlier in a tragic plane crash. Now, the grandmother is actually the mother of Kate's mom, and she was a very devout woman who had prayed the rosary every day. And so the book opens up a year after this plane crash with Kate finding one of her grandmother's rosary beads in the field where the plane had actually crashed during a, a memorial service. She is sort of drawn to it. And this rosary that belonged to the grandmother was very special because each bead had the initials of one of the grandmother's family members on it so that the grandmother actually prayed for those that she loved every day. And the bead that Kate finds in the opening scene is actually the rosary bead that has Kate's own initials on it. 
So that already sets the tone that there's going to be a lot of miraculous things that go on in this story. And in fact, this leads Kate on a journey throughout the rest of the book as she tries to track down the other rosary beads, some of which have fallen into the hands of different people. And as she finds those who have these beads, she realizes more and more that the Blessed Mother has been working miracles in all of the lives of people who have possessed the beads. That's the premise of the book. It does have some very serious themes in it. Kate's mother uh, is devastated by the loss of the grandmother and she's clinically depressed and she's bitter at God for taking away her mother in this way. And she's clearly having a major faith and mental health crisis. And that is portrayed effectively by Stephanie Engelman. Kate's father, who's an agnostic, is also a player in the book and he seems to finally come to faith as he witnesses the miraculous power of these beads. The book itself is well written, it's interesting, it's original. Stephanie Engelman does a really nice job of grabbing you right from the very first few pages when Kate finds this bead. It's really an engaging opening. She also does a particularly effective job of displaying just how depression can work serious dysfunction in the life of a family. The story is very endearing as Kate travels on her own faith journey from a doubtful and lukewarm faith to a more active and vibrant one. I would definitely recommend the book, especially to teenagers. I think some middle schoolers would also be able to read this with no problems. There's really nothing inappropriate in the book. It's just some heavy material with the death of the grandmother and especially with the mother's depression. Of course, the book is best read by families that are devoted to the Blessed Mother and the Rosary. But the way that Stephanie Engelman portrays the book, she does it with a gentle touch so that you're not overwhelmed by the rosary or Mary throughout the book. And in fact, even a teenager who does not have a devotion to Mary should be able to read the book without being overwhelmed by that message. Although the main character is a girl, and a teenage girl would probably most identify with the way the story goes, I see no reason why a boy wouldn't also equally enjoy the story. I enjoyed it. So I recommend Stephanie Engelman's book, A Single Bead, from Pauline Books and Media. That's all the time we have for the show today. We spoke with author and homeschooler Janine Zayo about creative ways we can use to translate challenging faith concepts to our youth. And I reviewed the captivating, rosary-focused book by Stephanie Engelman, A Single Bead. If any of you listening today have a question for me or a topic you'd like to have us cover on the show, please drop me a line on my website at antonycolank.com. That's A-N-T-O-N-Y-K-O-L-E-N-C.com. Also, if you visit my website, you can learn more about my historical fiction series for kids, The Hardwood Mysteries. I'll end, as always, with my wife's favorite scripture quote from Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. May the Lord bless and keep you this week.